welcome, excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues. Good afternoon. My name is Angelica Hakome. I am the director of the FAO Office of Small Island Developing States, Least Developed Countries, and Landlocked Developing Countries. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this event on accessing climate risk and opportunities in SIDS coasts, communities, and ecosystems at the Food and Agriculture Pavilion. Small island developing states have large ocean areas and abundant resources. They are on the front line of climate change, even though they contribute little to global carbon emissions. At the same time, SIDS are a critical hub of solutions, can provide adaptation and mitigation options needed for the achievement of the Paris Agreement goals. In today's event, we gather diverse stakeholders to discuss responses and opportunities to address climate change vulnerabilities of coastal areas in SIDS and to showcase climate solutions coming out of SIDS. This event is indeed very timely considering we had a UN Ocean Conference this year and adopted the Lisbon Declaration, which emphasized that particular attention must be paid to the need of SIDS. The ocean is also very high on the agenda of the UNFCCC processes. The Glasgow Climate Pact coming out of COP26 explicitly recognized the need for cross-cutting integration of the ocean into all relevant work programs and constituted bodies under the UNFCCC, as well as the annual Ocean Dialogue. The first mandated annual Ocean Dialogue was held in June 2022, and its summary report is presented to countries for discussion during this COP. A strong message coming out of the Ocean Dialogue is that Ocean offers significant climate solutions that can be reflected in national climate policies and strategies, and strength in finance and other support, including capacity building, are urgently needed to implement these Ocean-based solutions. Therefore, I am very pleased to have as our first speaker, Ms. Joannes Post, Ocean Lead of the UNFCCC, who will deliver opening remarks. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Joanna. Joanna, you have the floor. Hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have to hold it close like this. All right. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, distinguished panel members, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to represent the FCCC as the ocean focal point. Uh, it's something that's very close to my heart as well. It's a very personal um, part of my, my work to really um, build the conversation and the urgency around recognizing that climate action is ocean action and uh, to take that a step further, climate finance is ocean finance, which I think is also particularly important for large ocean states. Um, we have, as Angelique said, the, the, um, the mandate now from Glasgow, which was at, uh, uh, too long coming, but uh, we're finally there. And it really does entrench and embed ocean as an important part of the UNFCCC and um, at the moment, it's a process uh, mandate. It's urging uh, all uh, processes, constituted bodies under the UNFCCC to um, consider how to strengthen ocean action. We have the ocean dialogue, but I, it's certainly just a start um, of the conversations around how to strengthen ocean action under the FCCC. And parties are considering at this session, uh, although of course nothing is definite yet, about the, and, and this is something that came up very much in the Ocean Dialogue in the summer, how we can uh, blue the Paris Agreement. It's really hidden in plain sight uh, under the, both the Convention and the Paris Agreement. Um, the word ocean only comes up in a one, one place when it talks about protecting ocean biodiversity, but it's a lot, a lot more than that. It's about recognizing how much the ocean has already done for us and how impacted it is by climate change, but also the opportunities for ocean-based action, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation and nature-based solutions. And I do believe that um, small island developing states are at the forefront of the expertise on that. It's not just that you're being impacted, but you also know what you're talking about when it comes to ocean-based action. And I think this is something that also should uh, be recognized moving forward. So um, uh, really, 
ocean is there, is there to stay, and we need to try and get that message out to delegates, to all people here at the FCCC to really consider at the national level how to better integrate ocean and climate conversations together because they are inseparable and how to how parties can really consider the action in the ocean or in the coastal space moving forward to really move the needle and to uh, not just take action find uh, access to, s to finance within this space, but also consider it in a, in a very holistic way because there is, uh, you know, we, I'm sitting in the FAO pavilion, so of course the connections across different um, conventions is very clear, biodiversity, um, food and agriculture, UNFCCC, um, also, you know, considering the, the, um, the work going on in terms of reducing emissions through IMO. So we, we all uh, need to sort of consider at the international level how better to support countries and, and then at the national level how to integrate these conversations a lot better for positive action for our oceans. And with that, I'll pass the floor back. Thank you very much. For this, um, you know, reminding us that we're in the beginning of the conversation. We still have a long way to go and, and recognizing um, the impact of climate change on oceans and the role of SIDS as being on the forefront of the expertise of integrating ocean and climate change. I also thank you for stressing the need to take a more holistic approach to support countries across the board. Most SIDS are facing capacity challenges in addressing climate crisis. Given that SIDS economies are highly dependent on coastal and marine resources, it is important to generate knowledge of foreseeable impacts of climate change on fisheries in SIDS under different climate scenarios. This is why FAO engaged in generating climate data and information through a series of studies. In this respect, our next speakers excuse me, will present climate data and findings emerging from two out of the four global studies commissioned by FAO to contribute to fill the gap on data and support countries to better inform their climate rationale, design, adaptation measures, and proposals for climate financing. We will now invite Professor William Chung and Dr. Gabriel Rigondeau from the University of British Columbia to present their projections about the distribution, distributional shifts of the most relevant marine fish species to capture fisheries in SIDS economic exclusive zones. To avoid connection issues, this presentation is pre-recorded. But Dr. Chung and Dr. Reye Gondou are virtually connected to, and will join us live for a Q&A session if time permits. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Chung you have, and Dr. Reye Gondou, you have the floor. Thank you very much, I believe. I will present some of the key findings that my colleague Gabriel Wackendor and I did for a project commissioned by the FAO to project the future of coastal fishery resources in the small islands developing states under climate change scenario. Gabriel is a research scientist and I am a professor and director at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries of the University of British Columbia. The world, particularly the small islands that are so dependent on the ocean, is facing intensifying climate change that is projected to be increasingly changing the ocean conditions. Just to give you a sense of how environmental conditions around the small island developing states are experiencing. These are the stimulated past and present ocean conditions in the exclusive economic zones of seas under climate change. These are based on three Earth system model projections and the high and low greenhouse gas emission scenarios used in this study. It shows that intensifying climate change is projected to be increasingly causing ocean warming, loss of oxygen, and ocean acidifications in the waters around the states. There are other changes as well, such as sea level rises and increases in intensity and frequency of extreme events. There are already robust evidence to show that climate change has been adversely impacting many fish stocks and fisheries in small islands. These results are extracted from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the recent Working Group 2 report on the sixth assessment. 
Specifically, assessment of available knowledge has concluded that climate change is causing shifts in ecosystem structure, distribution range, timing of biological events in the small islands. Fishery yield has so far been negatively impacted as well. In this study, we particularly focus on the linkages between the shifts in species range and fisheries yield. We use numerical species distribution modeling to predict species ecological niche. Ecological niche is the combination of environmental conditions that the species are likely to adapt to survive and persist. We included 41 sits and a rather comprehensive list of species and invertebrates that represent up to 85% of the total catch in these sits. All in all, our modeling works include 12 environmental variables. We use a multi-model ensemble approach. This approach includes three sets of Earth system model projections of the future's ocean conditions and eight models to predict species distributions. The ecological niche is indicated by something called the Habitat Suitability Index. The higher the index value, the more stable the environmental conditions are to the survival and persistence of the species. Our modeling results project a loss of 10 to 50% of the number of exploited species in the exclusive economic zones of SIS in the 21st century, depending on the climate change scenarios. The upper map is for the low emission scenario, while the lower map is for high emission scenario. We only show the results from the 41 sits here. The change in species richness by the 2050s is a net result of species local extinctions and expansion of species into a new area. Some of the sits are at very high risk to loss of species that are important to fisheries. These are the top 10 sits that are most impacted based on our projections. The different color bars represent the different climate change scenarios and time frame. For example, countries such as the Bahamas, the Seychelles, and Fiji are projected to lose many exploited species. We use our projected changes in habitat suitability index as an indicator of risk of changes in fisheries yield. We show that there was substantial risk of widespread loss of potential catches in most seeds. Intensifying climate change is projected to increase the risk of loss of fisheries catches potential in the seas, particularly in the South Pacific and in Indian Ocean. In summary, our study further supports that intensifying human-caused climate change is projected to result in widespread and pervasive loss of exploited species slumber as environmental conditions become not suitable for them to survive and persist. We also project increasing risk of decline in potential catches caused by the projected decrease in species carrying capacity. Our project, our project highlights the needs for climate mitigations to reduce the risk. In addition, ecosystem-based adaptation in relation to the projected changes in resources could help reduce risk. This ecosystem-based adaptation may include reduction of non-climatic drivers of environmental changes, rebuilding overexploited fish stocks, and adjustments to changing species compositions and distributions. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, William, for underscoring what is at stake, and it's a lot is at stake for SIDS in regarding fisheries resources. I would now like to invite uh, Ms. Krishni Apadu, uh, who is a senior lecturer on environmental and climate change policy and law at the University of Mauritius. Perhaps we'll second of pause for a re reset of our podium here. So. Krishni, given uh, the rich tradition that Mauritius has in, in fisheries production and, and the stark reality just presented by William. Uh, we'd like to hear a little bit about what policy advice you have from Mauritius uh, that also pertains to other SIDS 
um, to maintain the performance of their aquatic food production given uh, climate change. Krishni, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about very quickly about three aspects that can be taken into consideration when designing policy in this area. So the first aspect is um, taking into consideration the knowledge um, and the skills of local communities that are already involved in the fishing industry. So I think more often than not, when we're designing policy um, in terms of fisheries and sustainable uh, marine, uh, uh, how to sustainably fish and uh, manage uh, resources in the marine industry, we forget that a lot of local communities uh, living in the coastal as they already have traditional skills and knowledge and we I think we have to bring on board um, their voices and also try to see what works for them um, for example in Mauritius um, and in in Rodrigues uh, we had the um, the octopus the fishing of octopus and uh, traditionally in Rodrigues Island for some time uh, they closed the fishing season uh, to allow for the regeneration of the octopus stock. So this was a practice that was used by fishing communities and it has now been implemented into policy and into a law uh, in both Mauritius and Rodrigues. So I think that's a good example where local knowledge uh, can be at the service of policy. Um, secondly, I think, as I've mentioned in another panel, there should be more sharing of expertise and initiatives and um, projects that are being done across SIDS in all the three regions uh, so that we can share synergies, what's working, what's not working. And the third aspect is also uh, the involvement and the role of young people uh, in uh, the fishing industry, in the sustainable fishing industry. Uh, I think that young people, they have a lot to offer in terms of designing innovative solutions. So we have to make them part of the solution uh, and try to get them on board, their ideas, uh, and also uh, make sure that they are seen as adding value to the industry as well. Uh, because, for example, in Mauritius, the fishing industry is not seen as uh, really like popular uh, as uh, you know uh, an industry where young people can go and work but I think we should um, give the fishing industry um, it's as we say um, in French um, les lettres de noblesse so trying to uh, bring more value and show that there is a lot uh, to offer in the fishing industry and that uh, young people can contribute to this industry. So I think we can gain a lot and uh, trying to involve uh, young people also in terms of policy design and policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishni. And uh, I think it's very important that you emphasize um, the role of traditional knowledge um, the importance of knowledge exchange and bringing in the voice of youth and attracting young people to, um, to fisheries. Thank you very much. Now, uh, allow me to invite Mr. Peter Mary, who is also online, and he is the advisor on fisheries management and development of the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, CRFM. Peter, would you like to tell us about the work uh, CRFM has carried out on climate change in the Caribbean region, especially? In, in terms of the governance aspects, and what are the experiences and lessons learned in this area? Peter, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and hope you're hearing me okay. Um, my perspective is really, what we found, I think, essentially, is that if we're talking about reducing climate risk um, in the fishery sector, we have to talk about adapting to climate change impacts and increasing resilience. Um, there have been a number of categories of adaptation me measures that have been defined, institutional adaptation, livelihoods, uh, risk reduction ma and management for resilience. But we feel that in addition to that, we want to take a perspective where we look at build, building adaptive capacity. Um, the development of fishers' adaptive capacity will allow them to make informed decisions about undertaking autonomous adaptation and to respond to any plant adaptation measures and recover from shock to the lab. It's also important, though, that we consider avoiding maladaptation. 
it's interesting that you can have situations where beneficial short-term adaptation strategies can make or cause negative social or environmental impact and make poverty worse in the long term. There have been estimates that um, between 1.25 and 4.48 billion dollars would be required for adaptation for the fish, fishing industry in the Caribbean, depending on the level of climate change. There are a number of barriers to adaptation. Um, basically, the lack of resources, a very important one, the existence of institutional or governance structure, or the absence of it, the presence or absence of informational and knowledge constraints, and the manifestation of social and cultural norms. To overcome these barriers, uh, what we think is that generally the barriers are interrelated and cannot be addressed individually. As a result, adaptation planning process must be treated as a series of simultaneous activities instead of a sort of strict linear succession of events. Actions to create climate smart fisheries and to build resilience at the local level can reinforce each other to create greater resilience on a broader scale. And building this resilience, therefore, needs a strong focus on action at the individual and community level. Individuals or communities can drive development of climate smart fishing practices themselves by learning best practices approaches from other individuals and by, directing, by directly comparing their approaches with, of course, some input at the national level from government. And there's some cross-cutting issues, some cross-cutting short and long-term adaptation actions including research and capacity building that will support or drive community adaptation, provision of training and business skills and these sorts of things. And it is vital that communities are involved in every stage. Particular attention we've been finding needs to be paid on gender equality, inclusion of youth, and the role that adaptation plays in reducing poverty. Adaptation actions are not solely the purview of fisheries divisions, fisheries departments, fisheries agencies. They cut across government ministries and agencies. Planning for adaptation and risk reduction in the fishing and aquaculture industry should be included at national planning and development, mindful of the need to focus at the individual and community level and recognizing that this is important both nationally and internationally. So I think essentially what we've been finding is that adaptation approach, individual input, community level, is the way to go in looking to reduce the risk that we speak about um, when we deal with climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, um, for stressing the importance of adaptation capacity to make informed decisions and highlighting the interlinkages between the barriers such as finance and social norms and how they need to be considered uh, as, a, as a collective force in um, adopting measures and also stressing um, the need to include women and youth and engage communities in any solution. Now, now that we have a better understanding of the challenges of fisheries and SIDS are likely to face this century, I am pleased to invite Mr. Dirk Sneeman, who is the Climate Finance Coordinator from the Pacific Community. Now we, we're resetting our, uh, <laughs> our states, it seems. So Dirk, thank you. And could you please tell us about climate finance situation in Pacific SIDS? Um, mainly, what are the main challenges and how to support these countries to improve their access to climate finance? Maori, uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's a, uh, a pleasure to be here and it's also nice to see our colleagues from Kiribati and, uh, and Vanuatu um, joining us um, from the Pacific Large Ocean States. Um, so I don't think you know, we need to go into the detail about how critical the ocean is and coastal areas are for the Pacific. Um, you've got around 80% of the population living within one kilometer of the coastline um, and you've got amongst the highest um, per capita uh, consumption of fish, for example, in the region. So really when you're talking about any work, it is coastal work in the Pacific. Um, what we're challenging, um, what we're finding challenging relating to accessing climate finance in the region is the high requirements from a lot of donors uh, for data and knowledge um, number one, proving that climate change is impacting on these communities and, and, and how it's impacting, um, as well as how to address that, what steps or measures to take. Um, there's a very high level of scrutiny required. Um, you've, you, you have to have you know, very technical information going into that. Um, and the reality is that information isn't there a lot of the time. 
um, difficult to access, not at the right resolution, etc. Um, and one big challenge we, we're finding, for example, if we're talking about fisheries as, as, as one example, is that it's very difficult to disaggregate uh, climate change impacts from, from other, other impacts on, on fish stocks, for example. And so we're seeing um, a, I don't know how to put this diplomatically, but a, a, a low level of acceptance um, from donors when, when reviewing um, uh, applications or proposals um, that uh, problems related to coastal fisheries in particular are climate-induced problems. Um, the counter-argument is always that it's um, you know, pollution, it's runoff, it's, it's degradation of coral reefs from non-climate sources, um, it's overfishing, and this is, impacting on, um, uh, this is impacting on the fish stocks rather than climate change. And so, for example, for Nauru and for, for Tonga, um, in both cases, they've been trying for honestly for years since 2020 to get uh, climate finance for fisheries projects specifically um, and you know we, we still don't know how long it's, it's going to take for them so um, looking at, at some of the work that that's being showcased today the, the information that we have on on, on fisheries on, on coastal coastal communities coastal ecosystems you know when we start thinking about things like nature-based seawalls, how to put them in place, where to put them, how they can best um, protect communities. Um, we think work like this becomes very important for being able to make the case um, in a way that is convincing to donors, um, in a way that includes scientific but also traditional knowledge, in a way that is um, gender equitable, that focuses on the most vulnerable um, and, and leaves no one behind. Um, so we're hopeful that studies like this can really change and, and be catalytic in terms of how climate finance um, can be channeled into Pacific large ocean states. Marlo. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dirk, for highlighting the, the challenges in generating evidence and therefore um, how that impacts the access to climate finance. Was, as you mentioned, these studies are, are just to try to uh, fill that gap that, that there is there and have uh, an abundant, uh, strong climate rationale uh, when presenting uh, proposals, but not only that, also um, for informed decision making in, in, in terms of adaptation measures. So thank you uh, for your intervention. We know that SIDS are stewards of abundant natural resources and large ocean areas, as has been mentioned before, and this represents an untapped potential to provide adaptation and mitigation solutions. In this next uh, session, we'll discuss uh, how to create climate resilient future for SIDS. And here I have the pleasure to invite Dr. Lars Rosenthal Apetquist from the Coastal Hazard Wield Initiative and Mr. Gerrit Hendrickson from Deltares to map the coastal conditions and hazards for SIDS, as well as to identify relevant coastal adaptation challenges. Um, Lars, Gerrit, the screen or floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much for the word. I would like to present some perspectives on how to tackle coastal adaptation challenges in the world's small island developing states. My name is Lars Rosendahl Arbequist. I'm the founding head of the Coastal Hazard Wheel Initiative, and I've been collaborating closely with my colleague Gerda Henriksen, who is a senior spatial data specialist at Deltaris on this work. So looking at the world's small island developing states. These are island nations in the Caribbean, the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the South China Sea, and total FAO has 46 members and one associate member. The total population of the cities together are about 65 million people, and if one include the local coastal features, we will calculate the total length of the city's coastlines to about 107,000 kilometers. So looking at the coastal environments of the cities, we can see from these images that there's a great diversity in coastal environments, and generally they're very complex coastal systems with very different characteristics both within the cities and across the cities. That also means they're very different hazard profiles and there's a great diversity in what are relevant adaptation solutions. So in order to get a full classification, hazard mapping and identification of relevant adaptation solutions, we're using the coastal hazard wheel. And the coastal hazard wheel is a universal coastal adaptation framework for the world's coast that I've developed. And it can be used for classifying coastal areas with 300 meters detail, for multi-hazard assessment, for identification of relevant adaptation solutions, and for standardizing coastal communication. And for FAO, we're using this system for developing adaptation overviews to guide adaptation planning and policy in the world's cities. 
So using this system to take a closer look at the city's coastlines, we can get an understanding of what are the most prevalent coastal types and what are the coastal types across the city's coastlines. And looking at the images to the left, we can see again see there's a great diversity in coastal environments. And the most common coastal types in the city's coastlines in terms of coastal length are sloping hard rock coast with corals, type R3 in the coastal as well classification system, and these covers 19% of the city's coastlines. The second most common coastal type are sloping hard rock without corals, covering 9.3%, while the third most common are flat hard rock coast with, a, with tropical cyclones, covering 8.4%. The fourth most common are flat hard rocks with mangroves and tropical cyclones, covering 5.5%, while the fifth most common are coral islands in the, of the type with sediment balance and no tropical cyclones, cover, called CI6 in the classification system, and these cover 5.2%. So these are the five most common coastal types in the city, and of course, there's a great further number of coastal types. So using this coastal classification approach, we can also get an understanding of what is the hazard exposure under the projected climate change. And we can do that for the five coastal, key coastal hazard types covered by the coastal hazard wheel. So looking at the city's coastlines together again, we can see that for ecosystem disruption, gravel inundation and flooding, more than 50% of the city's coastlines are exposed to high and very high hazard levels. And for the other two coastal hazard types, it's also significant uh, exposure uh, for, for, for at high and very high hazard levels. So using this hazard profiling, we can then also get an understanding of how many people and how many assets asset values are exposed to high and very high hazard levels in the cities. So here we can see for gravel inundation and flooding, we have almost one third of the total city's population exposed to high and high, very high hazard levels. And for the other hazard types, also significant exposure of people and also asset values. So we can then, based on this classification as a hazard profile, we can then get, go one step further and see what can actually be done at national city's levels to tackle these hazards. So looking at Haiti as an example, we can first classify the Haiti coastline where we identify 24 different coastal types um, where the main ones are the sloping hard rock, flat hard rock, and sedimentary plains. We can then use this hazard classification to see what are the hazard profiles for the five key hazard types mentioned before. And in the map to the right, we have shown the, the flooding hazards where we can easily see where are the hazard hotspots and where would it be relevant to take action. Based on this hazard profiling, we can then go a step further and see how many people and assets are exposed, where for flooding, for example, Haiti is 2.4 million people and 5.2 billion US dollars are exposed to high and very high hazard levels. Using this first, the classification and then the hazard profiling, we can also see what can be done at national city level and what can be done at local level. So again, using Haiti as an example, we can for every 300 meters coastline of Haiti see what could be relevant to do here to tackle climate change. And this list shows some of the most commonly recommended hazard management measures in Haiti. So for FAO, we're developing 41 briefs covering all the world's cities, providing information on the coastal hazard wheel methodology, coastal types, hazard mapping, exposure statistics, and relevant adaptation solutions. We're also making an updated version of the coastal hazard wheel app with new data sets specially targeting the cities. And these things will be launched a bit into next year. So please look at coastalhazardwheel.org for more information. And we, of course, hope that this work can contribute to tackling these significant challenges in the world's cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lars and Garrett, for an eye-opening presentation and showing how the various types of coastlines and SIDS and challenges um, when it comes to adaptation uh, to coastal hazards. Our next speaker is Ms. Tarika Temari, who is the Director of Coastal Fisheries of the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources Development of Kiribati. Tarika, please join us uh, here on stage. Tarika, could you please share a bit of Kiribati's perspective on management of coastal and marine ecosystems with a focus on fisheries to better prepare for coastal hazards and adapt to climate change? And how could Kiribati and other SIDS make a breakthrough in building resilience of coastal areas? What is needed to facilitate this breakthrough? Please, Tarika. Yeah. Ah, thank you for the question. And before I start off my small speech statements regarding the adaptation measures in Kinibas, I would like to 
uh, acknowledge the presentation on the coastal asset mapping. Yeah, I just want to uh, acknowledge the, the, the presentation on coastal asset mapping as I found it very important and very helpful to small island states in the Pacific in their decision making towards identifying the best possible and best uh, cont uh, approaches or measures that will fit the context of the Pacific Islands. And regarding the adaptation measures that we're implementing on the ground in Kiribati, the work of the Coastal Fisheries Division through its various sectors mostly works on the integrated, first, firstly, the integrated ecosystem-based management approach in which uh, we work through the, we have like uh, now uh, an ongoing uh, community-based fisheries management programs where we raise awareness uh, to communities and then followed on in encouraging the communities in building the, the sense of ownership towards stewarding their uh, marine resources. The active uh, participation of communities has led to the development of uh, community-based fisheries management areas and plans. And also we have come to uh, visualize some of the uh, tangible outcome regarding the, the establishment of uh, locally managed marine areas to mitigate legal and fishing, legal fishing, illegal fishing and building integrity to their marine ecosystem in their respective villages. Also, we, on the ground, we have uh, soft measures and hard measures approaches in which uh, in, in the case for coastal fisheries and my colleague from the Ministry of Melat we are implementing soft measures, including uh, seagrass restorations. As you can see in the picture there, we, we actually engage with our local communities to uh, teach them how to, some of the method we use in uh, seagrass restoration and planting. We also have coral reef uh, restora restoration, which were done by both the, the ministries in the in Kiribati. Thirdly, we also have some, we're trying to strengthen the uh, enabling environment through legislation development and enforcement. And currently we now have the coastal fisheries regulation uh, enforced on a daily basis where we embed and enforce some of the illegal activities that would cause harm to our land and marine ecosystems. Lastly, we also have aquaculture programs to support food security. And in Kiribati, we're now, uh, 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 we have a success story in spawning milkfish in, in captivity. And we have been working and assisting our neighboring countries in providing these uh, uh, milkfish fries for food, their food security as well not only our neighboring countries that we support, but we also support uh, outer islands in their needs for fries. Uh, we also have uh, an ongoing programs on clam and sea cucumber culture in Kiribati. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Tarika, for sharing with us some of the um, approaches you have in, in Kiribati. Uh, it's interesting, this integrated ecosystem-based approach. Um, I think also highlighting the role of communities about awareness and ownership and how they can take them to tangible outcomes. Um, very important work done in seagrass and coral reef restoration, which you also mentioned, and aquaculture programs um, to achieve food security. And this is all complemented um, with the enactment you know, of legislation and, and enforcement mechanisms of this legislation, which is a very important uh, aspect. Um, Fortunately, we have uh, some time for uh, some questions and answers uh, from the floor. And uh, I invite you to please uh, go ahead and, and ask any questions you'd like uh, from our panelists. Uh, is there anybody have a question? Well, no questions? <laughs> oh. 
Okay, great. Um, so I, I'm going to ask uh, um, Tarika to take advantage about uh, as, as you seeing how this results of these studies. You already mentioned uh, the the one study that you thought was very interesting. But how do you think um, the results of these studies um, can help at the coastal community level? Because you mentioned the issue of communities and the importance of engaging them. And yeah, I think the, the, the study that we made uh, on the um, best uh, tool to identify which uh, adaptation measures are suitable for the the, the different communities. The, the study is, uh, I found it very interesting. And as I mentioned before, it, might, it, it will be a, a very good tool in uh, some of the, the adaptation measures that we wish to embark in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask, uh, here, there's a question from Nancy from FAO. <laughs> Thank you, hi colleagues. My name is Nancy Aborto and I'm from the FAO and I'm from the nutrition division. And we've talked about some really interesting things here in terms of climate adaptation and, and mitigation measures in these uh, coastal communities and small island developing states. And I'm just wondering, coming from the nutrition division and knowing that aquaculture and fisheries products are so such important parts of healthy diets, I'm wondering um, if anyone would like to to maybe remark on the link of how these um, actions that we're talking about in terms of risk mitigation um, to climate change, how that is resonating with support to food security and good nutrition. Go ahead, Booster. thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we, so SPC is doing work with all of our members on uh, on food systems and so looking at the you know the whole range from the production you know whether it's agricultural fisheries um, but then also you know more from the public health perspective um, I think you know it's well recognized that a lot of the Pacific SIDS have got um, issues with non-communicable diseases and a lot of this is related to diet um, and part of that is being driven by having to rely on imports of cheap processed food etc rather than you know, being able to use um, the more traditional sort of food um, that, that was relied on previously. And that, that's linked to things like degradation of ecosystems, agroecosystems particularly, um, saltwater intrusion, which means you can't, uh, uh, you can't uh, grow your swamp taro anymore, whatever the case may be. Um, and so, you know, we see for, for, for SPC, um, working with, with our members, we see um, part of this uh, work on, on food security, climate change, adaptation, fisheries, all being part of the broader food systems um, work. A and at the end, you know, in ending up with healthy diets for, for, for healthy lives as well. Thank you, Dirk. Anybody else like to address this question? Okay, thank if you. Any if other I questions from you? the floor? Hello, can you hear me? Sorry, Hello? I think there's some, uh, someone, someone, please, could you please introduce yourself? And I think there's one online afterwards. <laughs> Hi. Oh, that was loud. Uh, my name is Aka, and I come from Kiribati. I'm going to ask an ignorant question, but I know that the ocean climate mixes is an important discussion when it comes to um, climate change. And just coming out of an indigenous forum where they say we need to safeguard traditional indigenous knowledge as part of the solution moving forward on climate solutions. And please educate me. What are some of the um, indigenous cultural or traditional knowledge when it comes to fisheries and oceans? You know, we are, we are the custodians of the ocean for time immemorial. So when it comes to safeguarding uh, our tuna stock or fisheries resources for, for, for that matter, how do, what are some of these um, practices? And the reason I raise this is because the more we focus on um, providing a solution to climate change, the, more, the wider the gap there is, generational gap between maybe the younger generation now and the older generation that had all the traditional knowledge of safeguarding our, our marine resources. So I would like to hear from all the panelists, please, on what these um, success stories are from the Pacific. What are these um, cultural practices that we need to promote and educate our, our young people so they maintain them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
I know you asked about the Pacific, but I think we should start with Krishni because she was actually mentioning that uh, in, in her presentation and the others can, uh, can take a stab at it. Um, yes, I think I mentioned about um, the octopus fishing uh, in Mauritius um, and I've heard that it's also being done in Seychelles uh, where for some time um, traditional, especially fisherwomen, um, they had the idea that they, for some time during, they would close um, for some time the, the fishing of octopus to allow for the regeneration uh, of the next batch. So um, as I've mentioned, it has uh, found its way into policy and it's now part of the law in Mauritius. So in Mauritius and in Rodrigues, which is uh, one of the islands. Um, so for example, uh, during the year, there's a particular period of time that uh, fishermen uh, and fisherwomen are not allowed to fish for octopus. So I think that's one of the traditional um, uh, knowledge. Um, and I think it must be done in other parts of the world as well. So yeah, that's an example. Uh, and for Kiribas, we are now integrating the traditional uh, knowledge on in our uh, current legislation. And for now, we have included the, the seasonal closure uh, for the, the bonefish and the cold fish that we come to understand from our, uh, like our old elders. And uh, during the consultation of the, this uh, regulation, we did uh, get as much information from them on uh, their traditional knowledge on when will the, the, the bone fish uh, spawn, what month and what moon, what moon phase they will uh, spawn. And that's where we declare them in the, the, our regulation. We close those uh, seasonal, like in, as in seasonal closure for the, the, that certain period, like three days before uh, and three days after the new moon. Those are the, the traditional knowledge that we included them, include them in the legislation. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe just to make it clear first up, I'm not a fisheries uh, specialist. My uh, studies lay in a different direction and working on the climate finance you focus much more on policies and guidelines rather than on, on, on that type of thing. But maybe just to highlight two examples from the Pacific, um, the milkfish um, in, in Nauru, you know, where, where the, the aquaculture there I think is an example of where the Pacific has been adapting and innovating for, for centuries. Um, Tuvalu, the Pulaka pits where they, they cultivate um, the, the swamp taro, you know, when I first saw that it just blew my mind that people had figured out how to live under those difficult circumstances. So I think those are two examples, but maybe just from a different angle, I think one of the challenges we have is finding these examples. I mean, you said you spoke out of ignorance. I'm pretty ignorant about it myself, so don't worry. Finding these examples, documenting them, and if I can say legitimizing them, um, because you have the problem coming, you know, looking at this again from the climate finance, you know, proposal writing perspective, you have the problem that we, we People know this, have been doing this for centuries, but we don't have the scientific studies, we don't have a citation in some journal article that we can put into the proposal to satisfy technical reviewers. And so we feel one challenge moving forward and where something like this, uh, you know, these reports help, is documenting that traditional knowledge, the tra traditional practices. Um, number one, for sharing with each other so we can learn from each other and, and find new opportunities. But then number two, to, to justify um, requests for, for climate finance, you know, when we're dealing with losses and damages to really justify, um, you know, where this is coming from. Thanks. Thank you very much, and I think we have uh, very excellent examples and, and a great suggestion there at the end uh, to, to come back. I don't know if Peter, uh, online, if you'd like to also chime in on this. I was questioned, but it took a while before you saw my hand. Um, I will stick to, to my focus on the first question, though. The question of that linkage between nutrition and what we've been talking about. One of the things we found in, in, in the Caribbean region among our CRFM member states is essentially the importance of seeking to achieve some measure of nutrition security. Um, in that regard, we've been talking about putting in place health and food safety systems, and, and we have developed a roadmap for doing this.
that will ensure or, or enable um, the, the, the development of these systems such that they benefit our, 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 our populace. In so doing, of course, it means that we're building resilience. Um, we also, our official folk have developed um, an action plan also. Our ministers, our ministers, of, our heads of government actually, have determined that we need to reduce our food import bill by 25% by the year 2025. And our officials have taken this on board and have developed um, an action plan that is geared towards that. And again, the part of the focus of that is developing that nutrition security, that food security. So when we link the two, just taking these two examples, we see that that is the direction we've been going. If I can very briefly address the question of traditional knowledge, we have found that there's a wealth of traditional knowledge out there, a wealth of traditional practices out there. But like has been said, because they have not been there in some published journal, um, nicely cite, cited and all of that, it tends to fall by the wayside. So one of the things that we have been looking at is the extent to which we can do two things. One, capture that information and put it into some of our documents. For example, for our flying fish fishery, we have try to capture some of that traditional knowledge and build it into our management plan for flying fish, um, regional management plan, and also seeking to, to speak to people and get that traditional knowledge, that traditional information documented under the aegis of scientific work. So I don't know very quickly if, if that addresses the two issues, but I felt I would step in there. Thank you very much. Adding um, these very important points, um, both from uh, the question that was asked by Nancy on, on nutrition and the importance of you know more systemic approach, and then also um, your the efforts that uh, your organization is making in order to document this traditional knowledge. And as I mentioned in the last uh, um, the last session that we were in, we as NFAO we're developing a SID solutions platform. So it might be a platform for also. Once these experiences are documented, to exchange it and let others learn about um, these important experiences. Um, I have one final question, since we have a, a, a little bit of time. Not a little bit of time, we have very, very little time. But I just want uh, uh, all the participants, if they can please um, share the take-home message, message for all the participants at, the, at this uh, attendees at this uh, session. Um, we'll start with Krishni and uh, move on down, and we'll go online. <laughs> Yes, um, I think the takeaway message uh, would be um, to really consider um, local communities uh, whenever decision making are being made, uh, because I think that we have a lot to gain from their wisdom and from their traditions about how things have been done. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my takeaway. Uh, my uh, takeaway uh, message that I would like to share with the, the participant here is more like the, the same with uh, my friend from Mauritius in uh, trying in, in, in engaging more engaging more of the local communities in in areas of uh, uh, um, in that needs and uh, require the uh, management. So that to ensure that the the the, 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 the communities and the, the nation as a whole will continue to benefit from the the, the productive ecosystems that they they the the, the productive ecosystems for their uh, current generation and their future. Thank you, Dirk. Yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe mine would be that uh, climate finance is hard. It's really, it's really, really hard. And I think um, if we, the development community, can um, make more investment into things like you know the study, the research, the traditional knowledge documentation, um, how to integrate the communities, etc., I think that will make it perhaps just a tiny little bit <laughs> easier. So more investment into that, um, you know, understanding the local communities and uh, you know documenting that science and knowledge, thanks.
Thank, thank you very much. And, um, and William, I think you also wanted to address another question, and then also you can share your take takeaway message for uh, today's participants. Thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, hoping also to respond to the indigenous uh, uh, knowledge uh, questions, which I think uh, can be my closing remarks too. Uh, I think this importance um, also, uh, in addition to documenting this traditional knowledge, there are wealth of knowledge uh, and experience of how uh, indigenous communities and knowledge can be uh, have been. Uh, adapting to the changing environment uh, with the uh, resources. Uh, and I think but uh, right now there are um, some systematic barriers, both as in terms of policy um, as well as economic barriers that are uh, affecting uh, or preventing the re-establishment re between the, the people and the environment and the uh, um, and the actions uh, uh, of uh, under this uh, indigenous knowledge. So I think uh, we, we need to actively uh, address these um, challenges and remove these barriers so that uh, we could uh, help facilitate the use of indigenous knowledge in, in, in climate adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lars, would you like to a final takeaway message? Yeah, no, thank you very much, Angelica. Yeah, so I think, I mean, a take it home message, I think one would be to approach these coastal systems in a sy proper systems approach with all the complexities in terms of geomorphology, biology, I mean, physics, it's getting the whole system space perspective. And then the, the second aspect of it would be also to have the multi-hazard aspect, as aspect with both the, the, the biological, the ecosystem hazards and the more, how to say, physical, uh, hydrometeorological hazards and try to to, to try to consider them all together because that also relates to to the food security and nutrition security both in the more structural way that you have this healthy ecosystems to supply food but also to take take the, the shocks during the extreme events and then use these kind of more nature-based approaches to address these these both the nature of the ecosystem parts and the more hydrometeorological parts and both combine these the nature-based solutions with the the select how to say at specific spots, uh, more hard and soft measures combined, and all in this combined uh, with the community's involvement to, to make sure that these these approaches work um, at, at a proper local level. So, so that would be my my condensed takeaway. And uh, Peter, please, a final takeaway message. Community, community, community. Um, I think a lot of what has been said, including what, what Lars has just said, speaks to working down at the community level. Um, adaptation, mitigation, all of it has to take place at the community level. The cost of inaction um, is between 21 and $46 billion. So we've got to do something. But I think community level action is where it starts and the right support from the scientific community as well as government. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I think this has been a very rich uh, session, and we've heard a lot about the importance of generating evidence, uh, uh, also um, the fact that we need to integrate communities into action, and they need to be empowered and uh, in, have ownership on, on the actions to be taken on the ground. Um, also, a very important point about um, traditional knowledge, not only to be documented, but also to be legitimized and, and, sh and shared. Um, the issues of inclusion aspects of uh, women and youth has also been addressed. Um, unfortunately, we have our time is up. Um, I'd really like to thank the Food and Agriculture Pavilion for hosting today's event, and we'd also like to thank our speakers for their for their collaboration and their very impassioned and uh, call to action. Um, we need to act all collectively uh, for SIDS and their coastal communities receiving the, the financial, political, and technical support they require to build a uh, climate resilient future and to maximize their contribution to addressing global climate change challenge. Um, many thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and we look forward to seeing you at future events and also sharing you with the published results of the studies that we've commissioned. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Bye, thank you very much.